confused a little bit about what that was about. That was a video that Sam shared with me. But basically, to, to summarize what was happening, was this, this man was falsely accused of snatching that purse. And uh, this girl that he had given the coin to then turned around and called an advocate group that is there to basically solve problems like this, to solve when, when justice has not been served. And through that process, he was able to actually get what he needed. That whole thing with the exchange with the pills earlier is he had applied for a prosthetic leg and they had just passed it off, not given him what he needed, etc. And so through his act of kindness, even in this tragic situation, something really good happened. And I use that video because of what we're going to talk a lot about in just a few minutes, about how even in terrible, terrible situations, sometimes God can shine some light. But before we get there, let's pray. Lord God, we, we love you and we thank you. We know that you are always there for us. Lord, as we approach your word today, and as we look at your truths, we just ask that you would help us come close to you. Help us to see your heart, Lord. Help us to really understand how you work as much as we can in our lives. Help us to realize, Lord, that you have our backs because you love us, because you're our Father. In Christ's name. Amen. Anybody know what day it is? It's Lord's Day. Yeah, what day is it, Joe? March 17th, actually. What, what's significant about March 17th here in the United States? Oh, come on. St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Where did the green? Nobody better pinch me, okay? I've got green on. St. Patrick's Day. Now, we talked about St. Patrick before, but in case you've forgotten. St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, at the age of 16, he was in England someplace, and he was captured by pirates, Irish pirates. And they took him to, to Ireland, and they sold him into slavery. And for the next six years, he lived as a slave. Basically, his masters used him as a shepherd. Now, Patrick had been raised in a Christian home, but he never took. Sound familiar? I mean, sometimes we can be raised in a Christian home, right? We can have our moms or our dads, and they can, they can share the gospel. We can go to church, but it just doesn't sink in. It's not real to us, necessarily. That was kind of what Patrick was. But during those years of slavery, he really began to see God. He really began to reach out to his Father, his Heavenly Father. And he became a Christian. And eventually, about after the six years were over, he was given a vision that this was his time to escape. He managed to uh, leave his, his situation, escape his situation, was able to get a ship, was able to get back to England, and had to walk like 28 days or something like that. It was a really hard ship to actually get back to where he was. And he settled back into his life. But then God gave him a vision, another one, that said for him to go back. Because the people there needed him. And so Patrick went back to Ireland. Back to where he had suffered, back to where he had been a slave, he went back there to reach the people of Ireland for Christ. You see, 
even in that terrible, terrible, terrible situation that he'd gone through, Christ used it for good. Christ had a plan. Romans 8.28 is our memory verse. And it says this. We know, and we know, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, oftentimes, we read this wrong. We look at this passage, and we say, oh, so, you mean everything that happens to me in life is actually, if I love God, is a good thing. So, if, for, go ahead and leave that verse back up there. So, for instance, if, if I... If I experience a death in my family and, and God loves me, then that's actually, I can look at that and that's actually a good thing. Because it's going to, you know, I'm going to somehow benefit from that. So what this is saying. Look at the wording. And we know that in all things, all things, good things and bad things. Because life is filled with good things and bad things. Life is filled with joys. Life is filled with tragedies. But in all of these situations, all of these circumstances, whatever you are going through, whether it be a good thing or a bad thing, in all of those, God works for the good of those who love Him. He can take that situation that you're in and He can find something in it that it will work for your good because you have been called according to his purpose. And that puts a different perspective on it. Does it? It doesn't mean that that death of your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister was a great thing. But it means that God can work in it for your benefit. Because he loves you. You know, it can be hard. Because life is tough. Life is full of bad things. We've been studying about Paul. And if you remember last week, there was the shipwreck. And yeah, all of the people survived. But what about all that cargo? What about the livelihood of these people, these sailors, their ship, the captain? It's gone. Right? It's totally destroyed. It's a terrible situation. It's traumatic. The truth is this. All of us, whether sailors or not, all of us will face shipwrecks in life. All of us are going to face shipwrecks in life. There's always going to be times where our the ship we're on, the situation we're on, is going to turn tragic. Well, what, what do I mean exactly? Because as a metaphor, a shipwreck is a life. In life is when any great tribulation, any great trial comes along and we get to the point where we, we feel abandoned. We feel like we've lost everything we can hold on to. Everything we can trust is gone. You know, you know the story of Joseph. You know the story of Joseph in Egypt. Can you imagine what that would have been like, though? To have your brothers sell you into slavery? Yeah, they got angry. You're right. Brothers get angry. Brothers throw you into a pit. And then they take you and they sell you into slavery. Can you imagine the hurt? Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the feeling of abandonment that comes from that? The hopelessness. Joseph was shipwrecked. These shipwrecks are times of great upheaval, they're of times of darkness. It seems all hope is lost. Think about Jesus in the garden. Jesus is arrested, right? And he, even though he had predicted it, think of the, the emotions, the feelings. Because Jesus felt like we did, right? He felt emotions like we did. 
and all his disciples, all these these men that he and women that he had invested in, abandoned. And when he's in front of the priests, and when he's with those Romans, he's alone. And when he's nailed to the cross, he's alone. I mean, there's two guys there, but ultimately he's alone. And his death he's facing is alone. The people are looking on that he knows at a distance, it says. There's some that are over there, but basically on that cross, he's alone. He's abandoned. Or what about after his death and the disciples? And this man that they've trusted and they've invested and they've followed for three years. Imagine how those disciples felt. The hope has come crashing in. The shipwreck. And sometimes it's, it's the threat of the shipwreck that completely unnerves us, that overwhelms us with fear. We see this in the life of Jacob, Joseph's dad. I mean, Jacob is, is no great saint, right? Jacob has stolen his brother's birthright. Now, to us, birthright is not necessarily that big a deal. Then it was a really big deal. He has stolen through trickery. He has stolen his brother's birthright. Right? He flees. He goes. He, he gets married to two different women. He's got Leah. He's got Rachel. And he's serving under a father-in-law who's cheating him. Eventually, he manages to escape Laban with his family. But he's heading back to where Esau is. Can you imagine the fear? And we, we see it. We see this fear in Genesis 32, 3-8. It says this. It says, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the line of Seir, in the country of Edom. He instructed him, this is what you can say to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I've been staying with Laban and remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau and now he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, is he, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. You get that sense of panic? <laughs> Shipwreck's coming. It, it, is he wrong to fear Esau? Absolutely not. Not this time period. If you read in other Bible stories, you see cases where a brother, because he's becoming a king or whatever, he's going to go out, he's going to slaughter all of his family, basically, to make sure that no one's going to challenge him. This kind of thing happened. He's terrified of Esau. That's why this whole big deal of, of sending him stuff and calling him my Lord and everything else, because he's terrified of what's going to happen. And it looks like Esau, with 400 men coming at him, is going to fulfill that. What do we do when we have a threat of shipwreck? Or what do we do when we're in a shipwreck? How do we survive? Well, Jacob's in a pen. So faced with the shipwrecks, the hopelessness of the situation, look at what he does in Genesis 32, 9 through 12. Then Jacob prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. 
Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But Judah said, I will surely make you prosper, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. See, Jacob knows that there is no way he can avoid the shipwreck on his own or survive it. But he trusts that the one who's been faithful to him, the one who has spoken to him, will continue that faithfulness. When we are shipwrecked, or when we're facing the threat of shipwreck, the only one we can rely on is God. The only one we can trust is God. And that is who we should turn to. Paul and those with him were facing a literal shipwreck. But like Jacob, like Joseph, and like Jesus, he had learned to trust. Shipwrecks, or the threat of them, will come to all of us. And we have a choice of how we react to them. Of what we do. First of all, we must never forget that He is with us before, during, and after the shipwrecks. God is with us through it all. He is with us before, and during, and after the shipwrecks. See, God didn't just make us and step away. Who stepped away from God first? We did. Our ancestors. And eventually through extension us. We stepped away from God. God didn't abandon us. We abandoned Him. We raised the barriers. We cut ourselves off from God. God was still reaching out to us. But we turned away. We barred the doors of our hearts and our minds to Him. But those who turn to Him, those who now follow Him, can always be assured of His presence. As the children of Israel, for example, followed Him, He made them this promise in Deuteronomy 31. Eight. He said, The Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And you see this theme throughout Scripture, this promise being fulfilled. That as we follow Him, as we believe Him, as we trust our Father, He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So even if there is before the shipwreck or during the shipwreck or after the shipwreck, He will not abandon us. We may feel abandoned. We may feel that everything is crashing around us. But if we're following God, we're not abandoned. We're not alone. David vividly writes about this in Psalms 139, 7-12. He says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around you. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. For darkness is as light to you. I love those words. It's a vivid imagery of the fact that there's nothing we can do. We cannot escape. Now, I mean, hopefully we would want to. But the thing is, is that no matter situa what the situation is in, if we are following God, no matter how dark it is, He's there. No matter how scary it is, He's there. And 
And we see this vital truth illustrated in Paul's life in the aftermath of the shipwreck. Acts 28, 1 through 6. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and, as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, Oh, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now, I don't know in where you're from. Some of you are from other countries. Some of you were born and raised here, etc. Here in Oklahoma, we don't have very many vipers. Where I used to live in Africa, we had lots of vipers. And vipers are bad news. Because if a viper, depending on the viper, bites you, okay, Sometimes you, you can get to an antivenom in, in time, but some of the, even the small ones, I mean, they, you know, there's one in Africa, they call it one-step viper. You have one step. That's it. I mean, they dangerous, right? And so can you imagine this? Paul is right here. This viper attaches itself to his hand. And what does he do? I can imagine my reaction. <laughs> what? How would you react? You know, you'd be freaking out, probably like me. Paul, Paul, God's got this. Whatever. You know? Paul. God not only miraculously protects Paul, but uses it as a witness to his power. Now, they call Paul a god, and we're not told that Paul denies it, but we know he denies it. We see him earlier in Acts denying, really, really denying when they call him a god. And you know that claiming godhood is not a really smart thing. In fact, trying to take praise from God is not a very smart thing. Remember Herod? In Acts 12, 21 through 23, let's look back at that really quickly, if you've forgotten. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. He was eaten by worms and died. Yeah. Nasty. Okay? So, in other words, if you're ever thinking of taking praise for God or claiming to be God, I caution you against it. Okay. Not a good plan. Paul obviously did not, obviously did not claim God. But God does get the islanders' attention, doesn't he? Absolutely. Which brings us to another important truth. That God can use life's shipwrecks for His glory. God can use life's shipwrecks for His glory. When life gives you sour lemons, give them to God because He can make lemonade out of them, right? Um... I told my daughter I would use this illustration. She left. Too bad. Um, but um, she, she's taken some antibiotic. And, you know, oftentimes with antibiotics, when you have them, they, um, they actually put a coating on them to make them really bitter so that you kids don't eat them like candy. 
And so um, he's he's at uh, she's taking this medicine and it's starting to dissolve her mouth and it gets really, really bitter. You know, she didn't get down fast enough. And she said, it tastes like chloroquine. Anybody know what chloroquine is? Dr. Lee, Doctor, you don't know what chloroquine is? Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> it's a malaria medicine. It's a malaria medicine. And quinine. Quinine uh, is basically a, a medicine that comes from a bark of a tree. And it is extremely, extremely bitter. But God in his majesty has designed it so that it actually is effective against a lot of malaria. And so this, this bitter thing, this horrible thing that people would say, why in the world God can use that to heal? God can use some of the horrible things in our lives, the bitter things in our lives, the terrible things in our lives to make a difference, to bring light, to bring glory. Shipwrecks, shipwrecks in life happen. That's just, that's just part of life. But God can use them to bring life. We often talk, we've talked in the past about Corey Tinman who was, along with her family, imprisoned in Ravensbrück, the concentration camp. But see, Corey Tin Boom, when she was in the camp, she struggled a lot. She struggled with her faith. She struggled with what God's purpose was when she was in this camp. But not her, not her sister, not Betsy. Betsy was the light. Even though the, the situation was terrible in this concentration camp, Betsy, and she was sick a lot too, but she never lost that joy. She never succumbed to depression. She continued to reach out. And along with Corey, they led Bible studies, they evangelized, and they made plans for what would happen when they left. And when they left, well, actually when Corey left, because Betsy died there. But out of that came great ministry. And within that came great ministry, came great light. Even in this dark place, God was working. God had his hand on his children. So, Looking at the shipwreck that Paul's in, did God plan that? Did God somehow say, okay, I'm going to throw this tragedy out there so that I can be glorified? I don't really think so. It doesn't look like it, at least. Remember what we saw last week? Look at Acts 27, 8 through 11. It says, We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the day of the atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. God was speaking to Paul earlier. <coughs> And Paul was sharing it and saying, look, this is dangerous. This is going to happen. What if the centurion had not gone? No shipwreck. No shipwreck. They would have waited until the weather got better and then sailed. But see, people have choices. People have choices to do good things or bad things. People make choices all the time. The centurion chose not to listen to what Paul was saying and instead go into the storm and the shipwreck occurred. You know what I believe? Man has free will, but God is God. And I believe that he can see and work 
in all things. Just like the Bible verse said. He can see and work in all possibilities. All things, whether good or bad, God will work for those that He loves and have been called according to His purpose. So don't look at the tragedies and say, well, God is causing this. Instead, realize that God is working even in the good situations and the bad situations. He is working in all of them. Because we bring a lot of stuff on ourselves. But God can still work. Because He looks for the good and works for the good of those who follow Him. Who have been called according to His purpose. Yet because of the shipwreck, because of this thing, God uses Paul to bring light to the people of Malta. Acts 28, 7 through 10. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Now, as we will find out later, this actually, they're, they're shortening it right there, but they stayed for three months. They stayed for three months on the island, and Paul, at this time, had the chance to heal, and share the word, etc. So we come to our big question of the day is, are you prepared for your next shipwreck? Because it's coming. Either a real one or a threat of one. Something's going to come in your life. I'm sorry to say, it just does. Life is full of these ups and downs. And you're going to come to a time where you're going to feel abandoned. You're going to go through trials and you're going to go through tribulations and you're going to feel like all hope is lost. But if you are following after God, He's with you through it all. He's with you through it all. The question you have to ask, am I really doing that? Am I really following after God? Am I really trusting God? Or am I trying to do it on my own? Because if you're trying to do it on your own, all bets are off. God promises to be with us if we are following Him. But if we're not, if we turn our backs on Him. We're erecting the barriers ourselves. It does take courage to follow. It does take courage to trust. But we need to remember He is always there to guide us and then strengthen us and comfort us. I, I found it really interesting. I had to go in and, and just change something at the end of my sermon. Because as I was listening to the worship team uh, sing, they sang, It is well with my soul. Now, some of you know the story of that. But it's about a shipwreck. You see, there was this guy by the name of Horatio Spafford. And in 1870, he had just recently, he and his family, they had lost their two year old son and died. 1871, the Great Chicago Fire broke out. And Spafford is this successful lawyer who has bought a whole bunch of property in Chicago. And the fire just wipes him out financially. Previous to this, they had arranged for a trip to Europe. He's got to stay back to, to try to salvage things for a while. So he goes ahead and sends the rest of his family on a voyage, on a boat, the Ville d'Ava. And he sends it to Europe his wife and his four daughters. 
And in the middle of the ocean, they hit another boat, another ship. And he goes down. And his four daughters drown. His wife is managing to cling to some wood. She and some of the rest of the people are saved. And she writes this very famous cable to him, saved alone. When he finishes his affairs, he heads to Europe to join his wife. And as his ship is passing over the point where the other ship went down, he writes the words to it as well, my soul. And you think, how? You've lost your entire family. <clears throat> Only your wife, your, your five children are dead. Your property has been destroyed. How can you say this well with my soul? Because Spafford trusted God. And you see in the end, wow, God used Spafford. He lost another child. They had three more children. Another one died. And yet God blessed the works of Spafford. And God gave Spafford. Because even though there's a tragedy, God was with him. And he recognized it. No matter what you're going through, no matter what shipwrecks you're facing or will face, if you follow God, He'll be with you all the way. He'll comfort you and the strength of you. And the guy who didn't say that. Yes, sir. Father God, we thank you that you are always with us. We thank you, Lord, that as we follow you, as we turn to you, you never leave us nor forsake us. Even in the shipwrecks of our lives, you can work good. Even in the midst of tragedy, you have your hands on us. You can not only help us through it, Lord, but you can use us to bring light in the darkness. Thank you, Lord, that you love us that much. That you promise to be with us all the way. So that even when we're abandoned, even, even when life seems hopeless, there is always hope. Because you're with us. In Christ's name we pray. I'd like to add a little bit to the sermon by reading a scripture that.